Um, it brings in two aspects, is that it's hard to get people to deposit data anyway, but really this is what we want them to do. We want them to deposit them in trusted repositories. And so a lot of the journal data policies, and this one is for the Earth Science Systems data, actually define repository criteria. For them, the trusted repository must uh, comply with this criteria. None of it, I think, is particularly onerous. I think uh, none, none of the data centers or the repositories that are in this room would have problems complying with this. But nevertheless, they are saying, these are what we want you um, as our trusted repositories. And on the other side, you can see that, in fact, they do identify certain repositories or data centers that they want authors to use. But as they say, there are many, many more. So they're defining repositories, but there are a number of different types of repositories. There are institutional repositories uh, and data repositories, in fact. All of them, I think, are complementary to national and international data centers. But you can get the institutional repository that started off, and a lot of us are doing this, started off as publication repositories, and now are expanding to include um, data sets as, as part of their content and item types. The other type, and ho um, hoes? Hoes. How do you pronounce that? Woes. <laughs> Woes. Woes at Woods Hole and DSpace at MIT. Um, they're both institutional repositories that have expanded and taken on much more of a data uh, publication remit. Or you can get the design data repositories. Design is probably a bad word, but Dryad. And Dryad is not linked to any particular discipline, whereas Pangea, and both of those are very well known, and uh, early, early adopters and early... Uh, early drivers, if you like, Pangea is for marine environmental data. A new one that's just come on the scene, and I, uh, Jamie mentioned it the other day, is Mendeley data. And that is hosted by Dan's at, from the Royal Netherlands Arts Academy. So there are, and obviously I'm not going to list all of them, but down at the bottom here you can see there's a registry of research data repositories. So if you want to know all the data repositories that are around, you can have a look at that. Now, that's going to change because DataCite has just taken this particular organization, R3 Data, over. But nevertheless, um, there is a register of data repositories. And it's good for you to get on that list. So if you're not on that list, make sure that you do get on it if you're doing this particular type of work. We're actually going to look at um, some drivers and, of course, it's the Open Data Core, uh, followed on from the Open Access Movement for Publications. But I think you'd all agree that there has been a paradigm shift in how research outputs are viewed. They're including much more to evaluate a researcher's work. Um, certainly, you know, uh, designing, even designing web page, writing software is starting to become one of the out output metrics. So data outputs are becoming part of that and increasing in importance. But I guess the biggest driver of all is the funding agency mandates. Because what they're saying in their grant conditions is, we want a data management plan, and you know all about that because you wrote one yesterday. And we want it to be open data. Now, they do acknowledge that there is sometimes sensitive data, that there are times when data needs to be embargoed and they accept all those conditions, but nevertheless, the final goal is for uh, data publication that is for open data. There are some uh, organizations there. Greg covered them, and I, I think Linda even covered them. So you, you've seen all of these names. I'm not going to go through them again for you. And I'm not even going to go through all of these nice, pretty pictures, which is the National Science Foundation, the European Commission, the White House, etc. But the funders do put down requirements, and part of their data management plan, and, and you must have realized this yesterday, is that they want to ensure that the data is discoverable, locatable, accessible, accessible, difficult to say that one, and intelligible to third parties. It's usable, reusable, beyond its original purpose, not just 
as a repeat experiment but uh, for other uses because it's interesting that some data sets are used by multiple disciplines you know you have a marine data set but in fact it's actually used in other in other disciplines and of course it's interoperable so you've got to use those quality standards that um, Greg talked about the other day so what you've got there is actually a framework for data publication and data citation one of the things that the funders can be is prescriptive about where you're going to publish your data if we give you money and you do the research we want that data to go in a particular repository. Welcome Trust, for example, specifies PubMed. But there are others. Um, people will identify their, their trusted repository, if you like. But now, now there are now lots and lots of options for data publication. So what you've got here is you've got your conventional publication, so, you know, supplementary data in your journals. Here you've got your data journals, and there are a couple here, and a reminder about um, CODATA's uh, data journal. You have institutional repositories that are expanding to include data sets. You have thematic and non-thematic repositories, like the EarthCAM library. Dryad, for example, is non-thematic. EarthCAM is, is obviously thematic or disciplinary. You have the British Oceanographic Data, which is a thematic data centre. And of course there's the national data centres, of course BODC is that as well. But you have, and you have the international organisations like the World Data System and things like that. And Greg's going to talk uh, more about those. So now a researcher can't say, where will I put my data? I have nowhere to put my data. I'm going to keep it because there's nowhere nowhere trusted, nowhere that I can rely on. Now they can't say that because there are more than enough options and all of them are trusted and reliable. So let's just summarize uh, why published data. <coughs> Excuse me. Open science, I, I mean some of this is Mother Earth statements and I, please forgive me for this but open science is a good thing. Publicly funded research should be open access of course we all play our taxes so you know, we expect to um, partake of what that produces. The funding agencies are expecting it, and that's because of cost savings, non-duplication, research efficiency, and um, impact of what their um, funding is achieving. It aids scientific discovery, and I put a little quote there from Isaac Newton, which I know you all know, but it, it actually shows really what data publication is all about. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, i.e. even great scientists like Isaac Newton used other people's research, other people's data to then refine, reuse and come up with his own, as we know, wonderful uh, discoveries. So it aids scientific discovery and that's by transparency. Everybody can see what, what you've done, what the data represents. It allows scrutiny, so we're looking for errors. We might be looking for errors. And accountability. You know, you've, uh, you've used the money to uh, get this data. Therefore, you have to justify, justify how you spent the money, etc. And of course, collaboration. And collaboration, international collaboration, is one metric that all researchers now have to put it in their performance reviews. Um, I'm sure you've helped people with their performance review um, content. And one of them is international collaboration. So data publication is going to really help your researcher in being able to uh, put a lot of content down for that. Economics is not quite the same as cost saving, which you might think it was under funding agencies. What we're looking at here, and this is from the Victoria Institute of Strategic Studies, Economic Studies, sorry, in Australia, um, in 2014, and huge money. They're talking about data creation and sharing may well be worth at least 1.8 billion. I think in the way of cost savings, but they're also quantifying what um, what there is in the in, in economic terms by data curation. I've put in red here because these are more personal um, 
data publishing benefits, if you like. It ensures that data does not get lost. And I've put the word preservation there, and I know preservation is perhaps in your technical part of this course, but what I mean by, and there isn't, I don't think, and you may shout me down, I'll do so, there isn't a long-term solution for preservation at the moment. I mean, it's, it's just not there. Lots of discussions, but it's just not there. But I'm using that word preservation in the sense of keeping stuff safe, because then it won't get lost. And I'm sure all of you know researchers who can't find their data. They don't know where they put it. It's in the back of the drawer or something. And of course, it will then assure proper citation and credit for the researchers. <laughs>